Red Sparrow is a spy tale about Russian and American spies in post-Cold War era. It reads like a remarkably realistic interpretation of what that world in the shadows must be like. And that may be because the novel's author, Jason Matthews, himself spent more than three decades at the CIA. And joining us now from Los Angeles, California, here's Jason Matthews. And Jason, it's great to have you on the line from the left coast there. Uh, I finished the book very late last night, uh, partly because I couldn't put it down. It was a great read. Uh, but I want to just go back and talk a bit about you, for starters here. How did you get involved in the CIA to begin with? Well, Steve, uh, after, after I graduated from uh, graduate school, I went to Washington to interview for a lot of jobs. One of those interviews with, was with uh, CIA. And at the time, in those years, uh, I had some languages that they were looking for. I was able to pass a, a, a extensive background investigation and uh, and a polygraph exam, and I started uh, started work around 1976. And 33 years later, here I am. Interesting. What what kinds of questions would you have been asked uh, during that polygraph exam that you passed? Um, basically, uh, there are two parts. Uh, there's a sort of a counterintelligence part. Have you ever worked for a foreign government? Have you ever, uh, are you in contact with an agent of a foreign power? And then there's uh, what they call lifestyle questions. Have you ever been convicted of a felony? Uh, have you ever had uh, trouble? Have you ever done anything else? Uh, then, then there's a psychological assessment. Do you feel more comfortable uh, alone in, in reading a book or in a room at a party talking to people? And they put together a mosaic of candidates, and um, they decide yes or no, and uh, one is hired. What did the results of, of all of that testing on you point towards in terms of a career at the agency? Uh, well, I guess, obviously, now in retrospect, they, uh, they, they thought that uh, my, my cultural background and my languages, uh, whether I'm gregarious or not, they thought I would do well in the operations directorate, and that's what I ended up in. Uh, the operations directorate are the men and women who live overseas working for uh, CIA, but like any other intelligence officer uh, overseas. And what we do, put, uh, put rather casually, is steal secrets. We steal the secrets that our policymakers need to formulate national security policy. Um, a little bit more formally, I suppose you could call us clandestine journalists. We look for sources, we acquire sources, which is called recruitment, we find the stories, we, we debrief the sources, that's agent handling, um, we protect the sources, that's tradecraft, the art of skulking, and we produce the intelligence. Uh, so it's uh, a lot like clandestine journalism. Jason, can you tell us one secret that you may have um, stolen is a tough word, but let's say learned. One secret that you learned that you passed on to your superiors that you think would have been helpful for your government to have that it would not have had had you not been over there doing your job. Well, that sort of, uh, that sort of drifts into what we call sources and methods. And even now, 33 years later, um, I, I can't really talk about the kinds of work I did. Um, I was involved in, uh, in Europe, in Asia, Eastern Europe during the communist years, Latin America, and I also worked uh, in, on, on the counterproliferation issue, which are the uh, weapons of mass destruction programs of the world's rogue states. Now, of course, your book, Red Sparrow, delves deeply into the uh, the notion of one agent trying to turn another agent from another country while agents in those original countries are trying to turn everybody's trying to get a mole in everybody else's uh, secret service and I, I, I'm presuming you've written the book that way because that's part of what you used to do is that right? That's exactly that's the essence of every intelligence service finding the source with access to secrets recruiting them handling them so that the contact with the, with the intelligence service and the source is not made public, and uh, getting the information. Uh, on a theoretical basis, for instance, if a, uh, if a, if a Canadian uh, media uh, representative in, in Moscow went to the Russian Foreign Ministry and asked about Russia's uh, energy policy, uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov would say, 
we're, we're committed to providing uh, cheap and abundant energy to the Baltics, to Western Europe, and to Canada. That's public policy. Uh, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry the next day can go to the foreign ministry and say, what's your policy? And uh, he will say, we'll provide uh, energy provided that there are no missile defense sites set up in Poland and the Czech Republic. That's called bilateral policy. That night at midnight behind the stadium, uh, Jason meets Lavrov's personal secretary and finds out that Russia is cooking up an energy deal with China. That is state secrets. That's the kind of things that we, uh, that we acquire. That was, I presume, a hypothetical example you just gave rather than something specific that you've changed the names on to protect the innocent, as it were. Totally hypothetical. Okay, just checking. Um, I, yep. you, you do delve into this in your book as well, the, the percentage of the job that is really what we think of when we think of that world. Very exciting, adventurous, death-defying, uh, living on the edge of your seat the whole time versus the mundane. How would you gauge those two percentages in reality? Oh, I think in reality, 85 to 90 percent is very mundane. It is analysis, it's research, it's waiting, it's targeting, it's, uh, it's knowing what the intelligence requirements are for that day, that week, that month, that year. Um, and uh, unfortunately, there's not many fast cars or beautiful women. <laughs> if there were, would you tell us? I sure would. I, I'd still be working. <laughs> Very good. Touche, Jason. Uh, tell me this. Uh, do you put yourself, uh, the theme, I guess, of the program that we're talking about tonight is using fiction to tell truths. And I wonder whether you put yourself at any risk, even writing a novel, when pretty clearly, uh, you know, you have changed the names, but the descriptions of the deeds done, the descriptions of the people in the book, you know, the real people got to know who they are in this book, I presume, right? Well, uh, absolutely 100% of the characters are fictional. Uh, they're, they're, dra they're drawn from a sort of a, a wide a range, uh, range of my memories of, of my career. Um, but every single comma, every period uh, of, the, uh, of the novel was uh, reviewed and approved by the agency, by the Publication Review Board. So uh, I was very careful not to re reveal any sources and methods. Um, what makes it so compelling, what makes the genre so compelling in my view, is that it's all about the human condition. It's about risk and trust and betrayal and about moles living amongst us, uh, you know, giving vital information to, uh, to the opposition. Um, and I think, you know, espionage has been called the second oldest profession, and it's because it's so humanistic and so uh, based in, in, the, in the relationship between two people uh, that makes it compelling, compelling over the decades. The authors of spy fiction, I, I, read, all, I read all the thrillers and I admire all of them, but the best ones in my view are the men and women who have been involved in the game, the John Le Carre's, uh, the Ian Flemings, Charles Cumming, uh, on this side of the, of the Atlantic, uh, fellow familiar with the game is Charles McCary. Um, and in those novels, they contain what I call the pop of realism. It pops out of the pages. It's in, inside baseball, and the lexicon and the characters and the activities. Uh, that's what I was trying to do, and I hope, uh, I, hope I accomplished a, a, a good read, an entertaining read. Well, you did, as far as I was concerned, uh, most definitely. But let me follow up with this. Uh, you obviously did what you did in the height of the Cold War, and uh, you know, those of us of a certain age certainly remember the Cold War well. But your book takes place after the Cold War is over, and yet it appears as though the Americans and the Russians are still... Uh, deeply suspicious of each other, borderline enemies, conducting business the same way. Is that the way it's really like today? I believe it is. Uh, there's been a lot, uh, a lot of discussion about what they call the new Cold War. Uh, Vladimir Putin has been quoted as saying that the, uh, the greatest geopolitical disaster of the 20th century was the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Uh, the Cold War, they also say, uh, we never lost the Cold War and never ended. Um, and now, instead of the Soviet Politburo and worldwide communism, 
the, the weapons and the stakes are uh, natural gas and oil, investment, uh, the Iranian nuclear program, what North Korea is going to do. But uh, Russia remains at the top of the list as one of our biggest uh, geopolitical opponents. Uh, well, your countries, while they may not be allies, they're certainly friendlier today than they were at the height of the Cold War. So why would they still be so intensely spying on each other, even to the point of, in your book anyway, uh, killing each other? Well, uh, the, the, the rough stuff in the book, obviously, uh, was a, a little bit spun up for entertainment value. But the, the great game continues. Uh, three years ago, 10 illegals were expelled from New York. Uh, Canada has had recently uh, one case with the, uh, the naval officer, DeLille. Um, and several weeks ago, a, a young American, allegedly a CIA officer, was caught and expelled for allegedly for meeting a, a clandestine source. The game never never abates. Uh, it change the face changes, but uh, the game continues, and um, that's that's what I was trying to capture in the book. I was going to say, do you miss the Cold War? But based on your last couple of answers, you don't think it's over now, is that right? Well. Um, I think the game continues, and if it's a Cold War, then it's a new Cold War. Uh, uh, it's very hard to, uh, to d divine exactly what, uh, what Russia wants, but I think they want to maintain and regain the prestige they had as the Soviet Union. They want to stay in the game. They don't want to be uh, ignored or diminished. And, um, you know, they have client states such as uh, Iran and Syria, and they're continuing to play. And, uh, Prime Minister Putin is a, a, a big part of that. Uh, all of the Russian government is peppered with former KGB colleagues of President Putin. I'm going to take a little bit of issue with what you said a few minutes ago, which is that all of the characters in your book are 100% fictitious. Vladimir Putin, as you well remember, Jason, is a character in your book. And you That's have right. described him in the most unflattering, icy, killerist I'm going to make up a word here, but killeristic, vicious terms that are, that are, you know, pretty out there. How come you did that? Well, I thought that uh, even in a book of fiction, uh, even, even in a book that is, uh, <clears throat> is generally written about modern, modern times, but is not nailed down specific, uh, specific dates, I thought to, uh, to have sort of the, the, the scheming, um, all-powerful, uh, Russian president uh, directing sort of the moves and, and the actions of the fiction characters would provide a little bit of uh, sort of realism and, uh, and, and, and current appeal. Have you ever met him? I've never met him, no. You're not going to now, that's for sure. Not if he reads this book. He's not going to like it. And no travel to, uh, to, to Russia in my future, I predict. <laughs> I predict you're right about that. Uh, let's talk about the title for the second, Red Sparrow, red presumably meaning Russia. Uh, Sparrow is the school that the female lead protagonist in your book, that's, that's the school she goes to, the Sparrow School. Why don't you tell us what that is? Right, well in the book, Dominica, the, uh, the Russian intelligence officer, who has high hopes for a, a noble career serving her country, is forced by an unscrupulous uh, service to attend Sparrow School. In the 60s and the 70s, uh, there was a school that trained women in the art of sexual entrapment, honey traps. Um, that practice has probably been discontinued, uh, at least the school has been. Uh, right now, I think if Russia ever wanted to do a sexual entrapment operation, there are probably a lot of independent contractors in Moscow who they could call on. But in those days, they had those schools, and I thought it was a very dramatic thing, and it was also um, it was also a crisis to put, uh, put, to put the, the female character through. She didn't want to go to that school. She was forced to go to that school. She was then forced to use some of her skills. It was all part of the loss of her ideology and how her ego was crushed, which drove her then eventually um, towards the West. Now, you just said you thought that probably those schools don't exist anymore. Uh, how would we know one way or another? Uh, well, I don't think we would know. Uh, if, if something like that w were, were in operation, I suspect that it would be, uh, you know, top secret. It, it, it would not be 
politi politically uh, acceptable to admit to it. You really described the Sparrow School and the efforts to sexually entrap her targets uh, really in quite some exotic detail. And, um, well, of course, you've got me wondering here, were you uh, on the receiving end of some of this treatment? And is that how you know to describe it in such fine detail? No, it was mostly uh, drawn from my imagination, uh, uh, somewhat wistful thinking. When I was, uh, when I was active duty, uh, I was never, never an object of anything like that. Uh, intelligence officers, generically, are very hard recruitment targets because they know the tricks, they know what's coming, they know the, the warning signs. Um, and many times, in many capitals, uh, I, I would go out to lunch with my, uh, with my, count, my Russian counterpart and we'd, uh, and we'd verbally joust and uh, say goodbye to each other and go, go off on our way. Hmm. Uh, you, you have also, I, I guess, described the Russian spy masters who are sort of at the head of the pyramid uh, in a, I guess, what, what Western culture would interpret as a kind of stereotypical they're fat, they're grotesque, they're, they treat people below them extremely poorly. Is that the way it always has been in that service? Well, I think so. I think it was a very top-heavy service. I think it was uh, uh, riv riven by uh, protectionism and cronyism, uh, corruption. Uh, it, continues, it continues to this day. Um, some fascinating accounts of Russian defectors, uh, some of the reasons they defected, uh, they were denied promotion. They were in the wrong clique. Uh, they, they had put a f one foot wrong or said one little thing wrong, and prospects for promotion were forever dashed. Uh, they decided to come to the West. I put all of that together and, um, and, and try, to, try to write a, sort of a, an, an engaging account of the very top-heavy and ironclad uh, services. I think the SVR, which was the successor to the KGB, uh, continues sort of along those lines. Really, they haven't made any changes despite the fact, or t to the best of your knowledge, they have not changed the way they did things back in the Cold War days. Is that right? Well, I think um, methods change and uh, techniques change. Probably recruitment, uh, recruitment of young officers changes. But the, the basic goal of any intelligence service is to go out there and, and suborn people to recruit them uh, recruitment is actually a counterintuitive exercise. You're asking a, foreign, a foreigner to break the laws of his country, to commit treason, and to trust that no mole or leak or count, counterintelligence problem will ever expose him. Uh, in the Cold War, the average lifespan, like, survival span, of a Russian source was 18 months. Hmm. Uh, very, very brave men and women who uh, continued spying for, you know, for the West uh, at great risk to themselves. But let me compare American and Russian agents for a second. Uh, I, I have no doubt that you joined the CIA in part because you wanted to do something that you thought would be of benefit to your country and you're a patriot. Do you have any reason to suspect that uh, your counterparts in Russia joined what was then the KGB for similar reasons? Well, I think uh, it, it, it's hard to generalize. I think, uh, I think many of them felt that they were, uh, they were protecting the homeland, the Rodina. Um, you know, the, uh, the emblem of the, uh, of the KGB was the sword and the shield, which says a lot. The shield to protect Russia from outside enemies and the, sh and, and the, uh, the, the sword to, uh, to wield power. Uh, I think, however, in, in Soviet Russia, as well as modern day Russia, if you're a member of the, one of the intelligence services, the SVR or the FSB, the internal service, um, you have uh, a lot of extra privileges, especially in the very poor uh, Soviet days. You got to shop at special shops. You got uh, pool cars, you, d d any number of sort of benefits, apartments, and the inexpressible luxury of foreign travel. All right, well, let me humor me on this one here. What if a Russian, one of your Russian counterparts came to you and said, how dare you criticize us for having Vladimir Putin, a former KGB agent, as the head of Russia nowadays. George H.W. Bush was the head of the CIA, and he became president of the United States, so we're both the same. What would you say? I'd say, I'll buy the next round of drinks. Let's go. <laughs> Meaning what? 
meaning, of course, that's right. I mean, uh, criticize, criticizing one system uh, from the vantage point of our own system, you know, our, 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 Western, our Western democracies, um, that's, not, that's not the way we basically worked. We tried not to criticize the clunky Soviet, uh, Soviet system. We knew how soul-crushing it could be. Um, and even today, uh, a smart intelligence officer will try to uh, assess vulnerabilities, assess motivations, but never, never with a, a, a stick, always with a, a, a velvet glove. Uh, there are four basic human motivators that we always look for. They're described by the uh, acronym MICE, M-I-C-E. Money, ideology, conscience, and ego. We all have them in some form or another. And what we used to try to do is figure out what motivates people. So your very hard-bitten KGB guy who insults you at every national day, one dark and stormy night might come to your door and say, my five-year-old has leukemia, can you help me? Huh. Uh, and, 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 that's, and that's the human connection in this whole intelligence game. It's people to people. You did 33 years or so in the CIA, and I'm sure when you started, you went in bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, somewhat naive about what you were getting yourself into. By the time it was all said and done, were you able to maintain your idealism about why you got into the service in the first place? I think so. Um, right now, in retrospect, um, I believe you know I, I served not only my country, but I, I served you know in a generic sense. I, I served the West. Uh, we we worked on a lot of things. The nature of intelligence always is that your successes forever remain secret and your failures are mostly bandied about and uh, subject to oversight and, 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 uh, and you know, ret retrospective uh, c condemnation. Um, but now in retrospect, I'm very proud of my 33 years. My wife also is a 33-year veteran of the agency. We were what they call the tandem couple. We worked together, we worked apart. Uh, we raised two daughters overseas. They had a fantastic childhood, bouncing from capital to capital. And um, you know, in retrospect, uh, the, the foreign sources that I recruited, I tried my hardest to keep safe. And, um, and I, I produced uh, information that helped our, helped our, our world uh, proceed through 70 very rough years of the Cold War. The male protagonist in the book, uh, Nate, Nate Nash, who I presume is a little bit of you anyway, given that he works for the CIA and he's trying to turn somebody on the Russian side, uh, he also, in the course of his duty, has to kill people. So you're not going to mind my asking, did you ever have to do that? No, absolutely not. 99% um, of uh, CIA officers overseas do not even carry weapons. Uh, we're you're, we're uh, uh, diplomats working in foreign capitals. Uh, the same with any, any, any intelligence service. Uh, it's, it's not, there's no rough stuff. Obviously, uh, intelligence uh, assets in dangerous areas like Iraq or, or Afghanistan uh, are, are armed, but that's almost a, it's a sort of a military footing. But your average uh, officer in Europe or Latin America or Asia uh, is absolutely goes through life uh, as a diplomat, more as a researcher and a scholar and a gladhander. Okay. Jason, um, your book, I guess, is um, emblematic of uh, one of a number of different cultural phenomena right now where this, this genre appears to be hot. James Bond is back in a big way. Homeland is big. Argo was the best picture this year. Uh, Zero Dark Thirty was a very popular motion picture this past year. Uh, wh what is it about spy thrillers or intelligence operations right now uh, that makes them particularly popular at this moment in your country's history? Um. Well, per perhaps you, one starts with the, the, the sort of the romantic uh, notion that Hollywood basically has created about spies and, and spying. But I think also the, the genre is so compelling. Way back till Graham Greene and, and uh, Somerset Maugham and a lot of the other authors, auth authors um, they were writing about the human condition. They were writing about doubts and about fear and about frightful risk. Um, and now these days, uh, we in Canada, in the United States, in Europe, 
we're faced with uh, a lot, a lot of uh, national security threats. The prospect of a nuclear Iran, the global war on terror, uh, regional conflicts, the Arab Spring, what's happening in Syria. Uh, all that, all that is, is inextric inextricably linked to espionage, gathering that information uh, to try to find out what's going on in the world and try to keep us safe. Um, and I think that uh, when times are unsettled, people perhaps uh, are drawn to sort of the spy genre as a, as a way to put some context on, on, to, on modern day dilemmas and challenges. Okay, in our last minute and a half here, I can't have a former three decade veteran of the company on the program and not ask him about what's going on in the news nowadays. Your national security agency in the United States has been discovered to uh, be quote unquote spying on Americans, um, collecting the phone records of millions of people. Have you got a view as to whether or not that's really necessary in this day and age? Uh, th that question has a, a, a lot of different levels. Uh, uh, NSA and, and other SIGINT, which stands for Signals Intelligence Organizations, um, have, been doing, have been doing this for decades and decades. It is a way to, uh, to find out the plans and intentions. It is second only to human, to human intelligence, which is what I did, recruiting the sources. Um, I leave it to your audience to decide whether it was too expansive and too pervasive or whether there were excesses or whether the administration would use it or wouldn't use it correctly. But I can tell you that the, 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 this young man who had fled to Hong Kong, uh, in, in doing so, has uh, gravely harmed not just the United States, but in general, the West. Um, he has potentially uh, affected our ability to predict, to, to find out, to detect um, the next Boston Marathon bombing, uh, Canada celebration, the fireworks uh, you know, display with thousands of people in the street. Uh, if we don't listen to those very, very fleeting and very deli delicate uh, channels, uh, which must be kept absolutely secret, um, we take away our we take away our optic into what the, what the bad guys are planning. I think he's done he's done everybody a, a grave disservice, um, notionally uh, because of his his conscience. You know, M I C E. He uh, he lost ideology and he he's trying to you know solve his conscience. Hmm. But he's done everybody a horrible disservice. The name of the book is Red Sparrow. Our guest, Jason Matthews, three decades plus with the CIA. He is the author of Red Sparrow as well. Jason, it's awfully good of you to join us from Los Angeles, California tonight. Thanks very much. Good to be with you. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.